Happy Sabbath. I welcome you all for the lesson study, the time which we are going to study the Bible. Uh, we are in the 13th lesson of this quarter, the last lesson of this quarter, uh, Making Friends for God, the Joy of Sharing in His Mission. We have gone through a lot of lessons about how to testify, how to look people through Jesus' eyes, what is a message worth sharing, how to work in the Spirit, how to pray. We studied a lot of things in the commitment life. Today is a commitment cha chapter. It encourages how to commit our lives to God's calling and to follow Him, take a step in faith. That's the chapter's title, A Step in Faith. Uh, now, we will start without any delay because we have a lot of things to cover. The memory text is taken from Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 7 is in the uh, lesson, but we will read 8 also because it gives more information to it. Let's read it. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man, and being found in fashion as man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day you have given us, Lord. Lord, especially you have been with us throughout this whole quarter, throughout the crisis which is going through our planet, Lord, you have kept us safe. And now we have come in your holy day to study your word, Lord. Help us to open your word and to learn more about it. Open our minds so that we may receive your spirit and understanding, Lord. And we are coming to the close of this quarter as we are studying the last chapter, Lord. We request you to uh, fill us with your spirit. Give us the commitment call in our hearts so that we can make de decisions today which will resound in working for you, Lord. I summon everyone who is watching the video and myself, Lord. May your words speak through me so that everyone will be blessed by it. I submit everything else into your feet. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, when we read from verse 5 to verse 11, we can see the great controversy unraveling there. We can see how it ends, how from the perspective of Jesus, we can see everything. How Jesus was humbling himself, came to the planet, how he died, how he resurrected, how he is going to go in heaven and be the king of kings. Now today our focus is only up to verse 8. We will read it again. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, it's unimaginable what Jesus have left when he came to die for us. His sacrifice cannot be explained by words of our mouth. The Sunday's portion is itself is talking about Jesus self-sacrificing love. That's what we are going to discuss sometime. Now, the verse, the text reveals that he was equal with God. That means he was God in heaven. He is in the top position in heaven. He is omnipotent. He is omni omniscient. He is omnipresent. That means he is all-powerful. He is all-knowing. He knows everything. He can be anywhere in this planet, in this universe, any moment he wants to be. But this God, who in heaven, who had all the pleasures of life, if he say an angel to go to that place and come back in this time, an angel will do it. A God who is able to command the angels to do things. This God chose himself to be a human being, confined in this body. That means now he is not all powerful. Now he is not all present everywhere. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipresent. He is limited. He is limited in the uh, dimensions of time and matter when he came to this planet. When he had to go from Galilee to Jerusalem, he had to walk. He had to literally walk for two days. He had pain in his leg. His heel used to hurt when he is walking, just like we have. We can relate that. That's why God even did that. He chose to be a human being so that we can relate to him. We can, he can relate to us. And we will be able to tell our pains to him and he will understand it. That's what God wanted when he became a human being. It says in the original language, it says that he emptied himself of all the godliness when he came to be a human being. Now that itself is a sacrifice coming in this planet, living as a human being without sin for 33 years. Let's look a little more closer. When he was in heaven, he knew that he's going to come to this planet. He'll be living here for some years and then he'll go back. Even when he was walking as a human being in this planet, he told in parables that in three days he will resurrect. Some of the disciples did not understand, but still he said it. He knew that he's going to resurrect in three days. But when he was coming closer to the cross, when he reached Gethsemane in the prayer time, 
when the human beings sin are being placed upon him from the time of adam to every sin up to now and for the coming generation if there is an next another generation all those sins are being placed upon him when he is starting to have that prayer in gethsemane that's why he is feeling the separation of him being separate from god and he prays if it is possible to remove the cup he did not want to go to the cross he saw something beyond the cross that's what hebrews says hebrews 12 two reads like this looking unto jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of god that means when he looked at he looked into the cross he didn't look at the cross because he did not like the cross the cross was a burden that's why he was saying if it is possible to remove it but he looked beyond the cross and when he saw the salvation of human beings when he saw the plan which was laid in eternity when he was in heaven and he said that if i die and if i'm not being able to raise up also but if the human beings can go to heaven i'll go through it and he took it it was a it was a very very painful decision he made because he thought he's going to be separated from his father forever we'll read a verse uh, we'll read a portion of desire of ages it reads like this hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror or tell him of the father's acceptance of the sacrifice he feared that sin was so offensive to god that their separation was to be eternal now we can see that he did not see his resurrection when he was on the cross when he was uh, when all the sins were put upon him he was not able to see the resurrection he was not able to see whether his sacrifice was being accepted by the father but still he went through it there is one more portion i would like to read it's in the lesson study itself in the first page it's written like this it's from desire of ages page 131 it reads like this never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand in the redeemer before the throne of god then as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses we shall remember that jesus left all this for us that he not only become an exile from the heavenly courts but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss then we shall cast our crowns at his feet and raise the song worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power riches wisdom strength honor glory and blessings he took the risk of failure and eternal loss that means when jesus christ chose to come to this planet he knew that if he came and if he had did one sin we know he did not do any sin he was tempted in all points but he did not do any sin but if he had did any sin he would not have been resurrected on that day he would not be able to go back to heaven he took that risk when he came to this planet he made a decision that his eternal life can be lost but he will die for us that's the risk which he took now when we can understand that that's what he did our response will be also the similar we will also be committed to love him back because many of the sacrifices we don't understand it says that only when we go to heaven we will understand what sacrifices he did because when we see the glories we will realize what he left for us one uh, writer says that when we go to heaven we will see that heaven is so cheap of the existence which we lived in this planet of and what we gave up in this planet for heaven only when we go there we will realize that i would like to read one more portion of sunday's portion in the last part heaven will be worth any sacrifice we make on earth there will be sacrifices along the way but the joys of service will outweigh them today and the eternal joy of living with christ throughout all eternity will make any sacrifice we make here seem insignificant our sacrifices are nothing Let's go to the next day's portion. This is the commitment call. When we realize His commitment for us, when His love for us, how is going to be our commitment towards His calling? Uh, in the beginning, we have some examples of the disciples. Matthew four verse eighteen to twenty talks about Peter and Andrew. We'll read that portion. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Then He saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed Him. Peter and Andrew had a specific plan for that day. They had a plan to go fishing, get the fishes, sell it to the market, get the money, go to their how house, do their chores, make a next plan and make money through it. So they had a proper plan in their life. They were going life in their proper order. Now one day suddenly a person comes to their life and says, "Come, I'll make you fishes of men." And they leave it and it goes. Now there is more to it, more to the story. We know that Peter and Andrew knew about Christ because his baptism was a big thing everyone around the place knew about 
Jesus. They heard the noise of the heaven opening and speaking. So many things happened and everyone was aware of this person, this new kid on the block. So they knew who Jesus was, but they did not realize his potential. They did not understand much. But when Jesus came to them personally and called them to follow them, they realized they are also valuable in the service. When they understood that, they were willing to go. When they realized that they were valued in whichever condition they were, they came out. Now, sometimes we might think they were fishermen, they had nothing to lose, that's why they left and they went and followed Jesus. But when we look into the story of the next person who is being called in Matthew 9, 9, it's calling of uh, Matthew. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. Matthew was a businessman. He was a tax collector. He made a lot of money, not like Peter and Andrew. He had money bundled up in his house. Daily, he used to get a lot of money, a lot of bribing, and he was rich. Now, he gave up that. Now, it's not similar. He gave up more. When we, come, when we look into, in our human eyes, we can see that he gave up more than Peter and Andrew when he chose to come to follow Christ. Now, both of them, what they did, the, not, not only these two, every disciple, what they did was, they did not, they did not look at what they are giving up. They were, they were looking at what they are getting. They were not looking at the pre- place where they were coming from. They were looking at where God, God is calling them to. And when they realized that that calling is more worthy than what they were doing now, that we would be able to be in the service of Christ, when they realized that, they chose the calling. They went for it. When they realized His love towards them, calling them personally, individually, they came to serve for Him. Now, we also have to do the same. I'll read a portion of the lesson study like this. It's like this. In the same way, God may not be calling you to leave your profession today, but He is calling you to an extraordinary purpose to share His love and to witness of His truth for the glory of His name. So it's not all. Of, it's not always about leaving your profession. It's about where He is calling you. What is the purpose He is calling you for? When we can realize that, when we can understand that He is calling us for something very better than what we are doing now, we should take that calling. Sometimes when people are called for the service of God, might be a pastoral job, might be a missionary, might be working in the church, might be working in the media for church. We many a times reject the call thinking we will be paid less, thinking it will be a boring life, thinking it won't be satisfactory. But we should not do that. God's service, the purpose in that thing is unexplainable. The happiness and the joy which you receive there cannot be expressed in words. It's, it's just a joy you can experience with Christ. Now, many people reject saying that only if I know I will be accountable. But there is a portion in Hosea 4, 6. It reads like this, My people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Now, here it's saying it's not only about not knowing, it's about rejecting also. So when you are being called to do a service for God and when you are saying no, you are rejecting God's call in your life, His commitment call for us. Let's not do that. He will also reject us. Now let's go to the next day's portion. It's about Paul, God's chosen wizard. Now he is a person who got the commitment call. He is a person who lived by that call. Let's look at some portions of his life. Now, when we look into Paul, the very best teacher we can say in the Bible is always Christ. But second to him is none but Paul. His wisdom was so great. His passion was so great to do ministry. His knowledge was vast. And his courage also was inexplainable. He lived, lived, lived his life for Christ like no other people we can say in the Bible, in the scriptures we can see. He traveled everywhere. He got into a lot of persecution, beating, stoning. He shipwrecked two, three times. He got uh, beaten by whip many times. We, we have read this all, all the struggles Paul went to. But without an unflinching thought, he was always focused and determined to work for God. We'll see his calling in Acts 9, uh, verses 3 to 5. It reads like this. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecute thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Paul's life changed that day. 
when he fell from the horse, when he saw the light, and God told him he would go to Damascus. And we can realize that when we look into the story of Paul, we can see when he is there in Damascus, when Ananias gives him sight. Ananias doesn't give him sight. The Holy Spirit works through Ananias to give sight to Paul. And when Paul receives the sight, he makes drastic changes in his life. He is not making decisions. He is not planning to do uh, a service for God. He is doing the service for God. We will read that portion also. Acts 9 verse 90 to 22. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straight away he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem? And came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound into the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confound the Jews which dwelt in Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Now, he, it says that he straight away went and taught in the synagogues that Jesus was Christ. He used to be a person who was persecuting, who was using the Old, Text, Old Testament references to say that Jesus is not Christ. But now, when he confronts, when, we, when he had that experience with Christ, now he is realizing that everything which he understood about Christ was wrong. And the prophecies which he missed to study or to understand now everything realize was coming to his realization that all these things points to Christ and he started to preach that and prove everyone that Jesus was Christ he lived a marvelous life with all the struggles with all the pains the dedication which he had we cannot explain in our words what he did what he suffered the times he was in prison but he was always focused and determined to finish the work. We can see the last portions of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. So he say that he... A crown is kept for him, not only for him, everyone who is accepting the calling and choosing to love him back and doing service through him. The demands of love. Now love, that's the next portion. The love, we know love is a principle. We know love is a feeling. Love is an emotion. Love is filled with power. It's filled with courage. But love always acts in action. Love always manifests, manifests itself in action. In 2 Corinthians 5.14, it reads like this, that for the love of Christ compels us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead. Actions doesn't always mean that you are choosing something boring. The action means the responding action to the love which Christ has given us. When Christ's love is compelling us to do, the actions which are demanded are not always boring. Sometimes people think like that and say that it's boring to be in ministry, it's boring to do religious work. What kind of pleasures do you have? How will you have an exciting life? How will we be able to do that and do this? But they are thinking in the wrong way. When we realize and experience the love, everything will be do exciting and everything will be doing will be joyful. The love and the passionate workers of Christ are always happier than the people who are in the world. Now, in, there is a portion in Steps to Christ, a very a, a one line I want to write, I, I would like to read. It's from Steps to Christ, chapter 5, Consecration, page 46. It reads like this. God does not require us to give up anything that it is for our best interest to retain. It says that nothing He wants us to give up, which is good for us. Everything He wants us to give up are bad things which are alive. Now, we have to realize the contrast of what Christ did and what He is asking us to do. He gave up everything that was good. In heaven, everything was good. The angels, the life, the joy, the happiness He had with Him, Father, the Holy Spirit. Everything was good. He gave up that. He came to this planet to die for us. And He is asking us to give up things which are bad, not at all good, not at all eternal. The temporary things He is telling us to give up. And hold on to the eternal things because when we are holding on to that good things in heaven, we will be able to live with him. That's the demands of love which he has for us. Now this uh, portion, the Wednesday's portion, talk about the story of the conversation between Peter and Jesus. We have studied this in our earlier chapters and we have known that uh, Jesus is asking to Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know I love you. And Jesus will ask it again and again. Three times they have that uh, conversation words back to back Jesus asking do you love me and Peter says I love you and Jesus 
gives a command, feed my flock. Now we have to realize that this is the situation after Peter denied Christ three times. This is after Jesus Christ's resurrection. And Jesus is confirming in Peter's mind that he is not being rejected. He still have a chance. He is still being accepted. He still can do mighty works for God. He can be the leader of disciples. And Jesus is asking Peter to build the confidence in Jesus Christ so that he will be able to stand for Christ. Even though he have denied, but he is giving again and again chances and uh, offers to Peter. Now, this is the same thing for us also. We have denied Christ many ways in our action, in the things which we do. But Peter, just like God assures Peter, he is assuring us also daily that his love for us is not uh, short. His grace is always for us, but we have to choose to be with him. Let's come to the last portion of the lesson study. It's Thursday's portion, Love's Commitment. Now, in that story, when Peter and Jesus are talking, in the last portions, in verse 18 and 19, we'll read that, John 21, 18 and 19, it reads like this, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and, walk, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This pekhi signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Now that portion itself, it gives a prophecy or we can say it, 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 it is a warning to Peter. It's, it's telling Peter that you might have to give up your life for me. And we know that Peter also was crucified. That's a very interesting story. When Peter was crucified, he said that I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not worthy enough to be crucified like my teacher. You put the cross upside down and then you can crucify him. And Peter died a, a, a crucifixion itself, but it was an upside down cross. Now, Peter knew that. Jesus was warning him. This is what he did. But if you are willing to do this, follow me. Making Peter realize that Jesus is telling him to follow him. Because by following him, Jesus assures the things which Peter would witness in his coming life. He would see thousands being baptized. We know what happened in the day of Pentecost. We, he was promising that you will be able to do miraculous work. You will be able to heal people, bring people to Christ. That joy, the excitement of working in the service of God, Peter will have that. But there is a death. There is a sacrifice which he have to make in the coming future. That's how we have to see when we are choosing to live for Christ. We will have to make sometimes small sacrifices, but He will show us miraculous things in our life, things which we will never be able to see if we are not willing to take the call. Only if we take the call, only if we are willing to sacrifice for each other, for our life for each other, we will be able to see miraculous things which God will give us. Now, 1 John 3, verse 16 to 18, John expresses a certain way of love. We will read that. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowel of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. The way we have to love is deed and in truth, not by words. So that if Jesus died for us, we have to die for others. If we have many good things with us and if you see a person with need, we have to be willing to give. Not saying that I love you, but keep the stuff to ourselves. The calling which God calls us is to love our brethren like ourselves. Sometimes we'll have to lay our life for them. The days are coming to an end. We know that the end times are nearing. We do not know what is going to happen, how the persecutions will be. We will have to have the commitments to sometimes give up our life also. We have studied a lot to commit our lives to Christ, to understand His love and to respond to His love. That's what we studied through the whole quarter, how to make friends for Him, how we will be able to sacrifice our life and bring many to Christ. I would like to read one last portion of the uh, Friday's portion and then we'll close it. It's from Testimonies for the Church, Volume 9, page 116. In every church there is talent which with the right kind of labor might be developed to become a great help in this work. That which is needed now for the upbuilding of our churches is the nice work of wise laborers to discern and develop talent in the church. Talent that can be educated for the master's use. We are living in the last days. We have to make decisions which are uh, radical in living for him, in making commitments for him. 
We have talents in our churches. Many talents are hidden. Many youth, children can do mighty. But sometimes we hide them, saying that a pastoral service is not good. You will get very less grade. You don't have to do that. You can choose something else. Because when we ask children, they want to do God's work. But when they are slowly, slowly becoming bigger, the family, the pressure from the friends, the society are making them choose different careers than serving for Christ. It says that we have to develop our talents. But in the childhood itself, we have to develop and turn it to the talents can be used by the master so that it can be used for a service and success can be seen in. So let us all commit our lives as the squadron is ending to make friends for God, to take decisions, to make small, small sacrifices because the sacrifice which he did was ultimate. Sacrifice which we have to make is small only to give up the bad things, but to retain the good things and to serve for Him. May God bless you all. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath day. Lord, helping us to understand how your love is for us, Lord, how much you love us, Lord, what you sacrificed for us, Lord. What we can give back is very little, very less, Lord. But Lord, help us and give us the strength to make that decisions, to love you back. And when that love is generating in ourselves, we would be able to make commitments which are strong enough to stay for you, to serve for you. And Lord, together with you in working through us, Lord, help us to bring many friends for you, Lord. As we have been studying through the quarter, as we are going to learn a new quarter next week, Lord, a new lesson, you be with us and continue to be with us as we are going to study and come closer to you. We submit everyone and myself into your feet. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.